So thanks for coming. Um, who knows what BPF stands for? Okay, about half of the room. So BPF is a Berkeley Peckel filter, and it's uh, now a kind of a small virtual machine in a Linux kernel, and it's also a, a bytecode, so that uh, virtual machine can interpret bytecode that you saw in the kernel. And uh, it's called Linux Superpowers because you can do a lot of things with that that I will uh, present today. Um, I am Alban, and um, I work on uh, the container runtime rocket. And I like container, Kubernetes, systemd, Linux, uh, all these kind of uh, low-level Linux things. And uh, I'm now working on Kubernetes, on with scope, on uh, eBPF. So um, I'm starting this talk by uh, showing BPF with a TCP dump. Um, I guess everybody knows TCP dump, or how many of you? No, TCP dump. Yeah, everybody. Okay, good. <laughs> so I guess you are very familiar with this kind of uh, drawings, um, where a network packet come to a network interface, and uh, there is some routing decision, and it can be routed to um, a local process like Apache in this example. Um, so um, TCP dump can. Uh, get all the packets that go to um, network interface. And to do that, uh, it needs to get the packets even before uh, a routing decision has been made. So even if the packets are dropped or something else, uh, uh, TCPDump can get a copy of it. To do that, it creates a socket of type AF packet. That's basically a way to tell the kernel, uh, I want to receive all the packets on uh, this network interface. Um, most of the time, we don't necessarily want to get all the packets, but only some packets we are interested in, for example, on a specific TCP port or thing like that, because there might be a lot of uh, traffic, so getting everything can be quite slow or not good. Um, on TCP dump, uh, quite uh, complex filters. You can uh, make Boolean expression to say this IP or not this IP. And, um, and then, this is kind of an arbitrary code. And to filter the packets TCP dump wants to receive, it uses a BPF, so Berkeley uh, Packet Filter. And BPF is some kind of filter which is uh, installed here on the socket. And in this case, um, TCP dump will not receive all the packets, but only the packets that uh, the filter decides to accept or not. And in case the filter says uh, this packet should not be sent to TCP dump, um, TCP dump is not even woken up. It's, uh, it doesn't take uh, CPU cycles uh, because it's done in the kernel here before um, the packets go to user space. Um, it's done this way and not as a kernel module because if uh, for each different um, filter, we build a new kernel module to insert that will be uh, not really practical. Uh, although it's quite complicated because um, kernel modules are quite sp specifically tied to a kernel version. So we cannot uh, really do that easily. And that will be risky because kernel modules can do something wrong. And uh, if there is a bug, they could crash uh, the kernel. But with uh, BPF, if there is a bug in the BPF code, um, the, the kernel will not crash with that. Okay, um, any questions so far? All good. So um, this is a, I will now introduce uh, eBPF. eBPF is, uh, stand for extended BPF. And it's, it can do quite more than just socket filtering that we have shown um, with TCP dump. You can uh, get, uh, it can do tracing in the Linux kernel to know how many times a specific kernel function has been called, or uh, filter on um, syscalls to know how many uh, syscalls uh, open, close, or whatever has been called. And um, it can do a lot of uh, tracing and also quite a lot of uh, networking to, um, for example, we can do uh, things as complex as uh, NAT uh, just with BPF. So uh, I will first uh, present how things work, 
And at the end of um, my talk, I will uh, show some demos on, on the terminal. So first, how it works. Um, this is first with uh, CBPF, that stands for Classic BPF. Uh, that was in, uh, in the old days, let's say, where you write the BPF bytecodes uh, kind of manually. And then you can say, uh, use the system called sexlock OPT to attach that bytecode to a socket. And then the kernel will um, uh, compile that to the uh, native code. And then um, use that to filter the packets on, on that socket. With eBPF, um, it's a bit different. First here, you can see some code in C. That's uh, quite a lot easier to write than uh, bytecode directly. So you can write something in um, a subset of the C language, um, which is a lot easier, and then compile it with uh, C lang. You compile it in um, the BPF architecture to get that bytecode, and then um, a program will uh, call the BPF system call to get a file descriptor for that, and then uh, set SOCOPT to um, attach it, uh, to send it to the kernel and attach it on the socket. And here there is another component, the BPF verifier that I will describe later. Uh, it's just to check that uh, the program is uh, sane and doesn't do anything bad. Um, so in this case, uh, with the BPF system call, with this new system call, we can uh, uh, do a lot more than just uh, fil uh, socket filtering as before. We can do things with KProb, with uh, trace point to know uh, um, a lot of events go through trace points and know what's happening. So uh, this is the eBPF sandbox. So uh, the BPF code is running inside the kernel, so it's quite a privileged environment. Uh, it could be dangerous. So there is this sandbox to uh, check that it doesn't do anything bad for the kernel. So it is not supposed to crash the kernel, for example. Um, one thing which is restricted is uh, it's not allowed to do loops. So it's not a lot to write code which loop forever and then the kernel doesn't do anything else. Um, so a BPF uh, program is basically just a function. So a function has some input. That's the parameter here. In this case, that's um, a socket buffer, um, uh, a packet, and some output. In the case of socket filter is to say, uh, I want to keep this packet or drop this packet. And then the program can call some other function, which are the BPF helper functions. Um, for example, there is some function related to uh, computing the checksum of a packet. And there are some restrictions. It's not allowed to access uh, any uh, kind of kernel memory. So we cannot write uh, on a kernel memory somewhere which uh, for the protection of the kernel. Um, there is different kind of eBPF programs. Um, the first that I've talked about with uh, TCP dump is uh, on sockets for socket filtering. And, um, this is uh, not a privileged operation, so any program can, um, can do that without being root. And then there is other kind of uh, BPF programs um, on uh, trust points. So there are a lot of different trace points which are declared in the kernel, in the Linux kernel. For example, every time a process moves from one C loop to another, there is a trace point there. So we can uh, attach a BPF program to execute uh, some code there. Or when, um, when something happens on the file system with a, um, a trace point on the VFS, um, some on networks, but not that many, and a lot of things like that. There are other kind of BPF programs on KProps. So on KProps, you can attach a BPF program every time a kernel function is uh, executed, even if the author of that kernel function did not plan for that. So it's like a breakpoint in GDB, if you like. Uh, that every time we hit that uh, function, it will execute the BPF program and then uh, uh, continue. Um, and then uprobe, that's a bit the same thing, but for um, user learned programs. And I will uh, show a demo with that later with Bash. And other kind of eBPF programs, um, you can attach uh, 
EPF program on a network uh, interface. And every time a packet uh, comes to, from the network, um, the BPF program can take decisions like um, how to classify the packet or to, or to redirect it to another um, network interface or modify the packet. So we can do things like NAT with that. And the last one I mentioned is uh, XDP. That's um, to do some filtering very early in a uh, network stack to, uh, that can be used for to get protection from a distributed DOS. Um, so by uh, running uh, a filter very early, we can drop most of the packet uh, without uh, executing most of the network stack. Um, in the kernel, um, there is this macro, a BPF prog run to execute um, BPF programs. And this macro is used in uh, several subsystems of the kernel, like for example in sockets or kprob or tracepoint every time there is a subsystem that uh, use uh, BPF. Um, before continuing, uh, any questions or is it good? Yes? Question. You said earlier that uh, you can execute them from any non-privileged program on a socket, right? That sounds pretty fast. Uh, yes, I can go back to that, for example. So um, in this example, TCP dump created a socket of type AF packet. Um, and then the program will be executed uh, on that socket. But if another uh, TCP dump uh, program is executed, that will not share the same uh, BPF uh, programs. So that's uh, separated. Um, it's in the space of that program, basically. That program. Or of uh, that socket. Yeah, of that socket, yes. And when you share the socket, it's going to be different. Uh, yes, if another process gets the same socket, uh, by inheritance or so, uh, it, it has the same uh, filter on it. Um, so a filter can be attached to socket of type AF packet, but also on other kind of socket, like a uh, unique socket or uh, IF, INET. Um, in, in the case of IF, INET, is, there is no need to be root to create a socket, so, um, um, and you only change what you receive yourself what, not what other uh, people receive, <coughs> so that it's safe. And to create a socket of type AF packet, you need some privilege already. To yeah, I was just wondering about like possible like some control program that like does some really heavy distribution thing. Yes. Because opening like, I think open like one thousand to network not a physical thing and you were running like in half one so you didn't know that. Right. Um I was just yeah. Okay, uh, the question was about um, whether well, it's done. What I was asking is um, because a user space program without privilege can attach VPF uh, to an INET socket now. Uh, if I couldn't just spawn a thousand sockets and have the computation overhead. Right. So, what's the computation overhead of BPF basically? And it's not uh, much because you cannot do much with BPF. There is a limit of number of instructions. You can do, do loops, so whatever you do is not going to take much time. Uh, so uh, eBPF maps. Uh, so maps is a new feature of uh, extended BPF, which was not in uh, classic BPF before. And that's a nice feature. Basically, a map is uh, it's like a hash table or uh, array of some kind of variable which, is, which can be shared between the eBPF program in the kernel and the user space program. So um, that can be used for the BPF program to send information back to user space, or that can be used between different executions of the BPF program. Like, for example, if a BPF program is executed for every packet uh, between different uh, instances of the execution, uh, that could, we could get some context with that, uh, some variable. And that could be used uh, for basically anything. And, and uh, this variable is, uh, can be modified both from user space or from um, the kernel with a different API. From user space, the API is always through the BPF system call, and that's a kind of a multiplexing system call, and there is some command to create a new map to uh, look up 
look up an element in the map or delete an element in the map. And from the BPF side, there is helper function which uh, can do the same. Um, there is different kind of BPF maps. There is uh, hash table, generic hash table. It's kind of um, uh, echoing. Okay. <laughs> and there is um, array uh, where you you can index um, by your integer. There is uh, other kind of specific maps, for example, uh, to get the stacks of the program, or uh, other that I will not go today. Um, another component is the BPF ver verifier. So the goal of that is to make sure that you, uh, the program doesn't do anything bad or dangerous. So what it verifies is uh, first that you don't do any uh, loops or go to backward. You can do go to forward or have a jump instruction forward, but not backward. And it ensures that the program terminates and doesn't loop forever. Um, so that makes things more complicated to write because when you write a code in C, um, if you cannot do loop, that's not so convenient. It might still be possible to do some small loops if uh, if the compiler unrolls the loops, but uh, yeah, that's still not so practical. Um, the verifier will check that you don't access uh, any memory that you're not supposed to access. Like when you dereference a pointer, it will check that uh, uh, it's not any kernel memory that you're not supposed to access. So for example, it's a lot to um, read the context. The context is basically the first parameter of the um, BPF function. So for socket filtering, it's, um, the first parameter is the socket buffer to read the content of the packet. You can uh, read on the stack, but not uh, uninitialized memory. Um, but basically, everything which is uh, outside of that uh, can be restricted. And there is um, some BPF function which are available in some kind of BPF program, but not others. Uh, a good example of that is there is a BPF function to read um, any kind of kernel memory, but this is available in kprobs, for example but not in a socket filter. So depending on what kind of privilege you, it is. Uh, there are limit in size, a uh, very small stack, uh, 512 bytes, I think. Um, the number of instructions in the program is limited. Um, on, in BPF, it's possible to call another BPF program, but it's not possible to have program A calling program B, which calls program A and B and back and forth infinitely. That will do a loop. So this is limited as well. Um, there are other limitations. Uh, basically, in this file in the kernel, there's a lot of code for that. Um, next thing is um, the helper functions. So helper functions is uh, just functions which are um, uh, implemented in the Linux kernel. And um, that, that's kind of part of the Linux API, um, as long as the kernel grow and um, develop new features. There are new uh, helper functions. So uh, first, the thing I mentioned before is the um, map, map related function to look up an element in a map or this kind of thing. Um, and I will show a lot of other uh, functions. Basically, there is a list. If you go to this link, um, there is a list of all the uh, BPF helper functions with the kernel version that has have been added. And helper functions are quite useful to uh, do something which will not be possible just with, uh, within BPF because of the restrictions. For example, there is a function to do some computation that's about um, computing the hash of a packet uh, for checksums. Uh, that's not really possible to do without loops sometimes, so um, there is a, a helper function for that. Okay, so far I've only talked about BPF as a Linux feature, something which is in a Linux kernel. There is a couple of projects uh, doing BPF in user space, but that's uh, for a completely different use case. That's not for tracing or networking really, but for something else. Um, so the two projects I can mention are uh, UBPF for user land BPF or RBPF for Rust. They are both into in the Apache license. 
so uh, it's more uh, liberal license than the Linux kernel. And they have uh, interpreters and uh, compilers and uh, it can run the BPF program in uh, user space. Um, so there is one in C, one in Rust. And uh, I will just uh, mention briefly two possible use cases, nothing that are implemented, but uh, a couple of ideas um, for the bus. Uh, so the bus is, um, if you have a Linux uh, system, basically all Linux system have the bus, I think. Um, it's a um, publish subscribe mechanism, uh, IPC mechanism between process. So for example, um, the network manager process can talk to the network manager applet um, uh, by emitting a signal uh, that is a message sent to the bus demand and then the bus demand will forward it to um, the other process. And there is a, a way to ask the bus demand to register to some kind of signals. And this is actually uh, a bit complicated. There is a, a match rules, which is um, a way to say, uh, I want to uh, receive this kind of uh, signals. <coughs> and nowadays, there is uh, more and more uh, criteria that you can put here. So for new, um, if an application has some really complicated rules to get um, um, specific kind of signals, um, the idea will be to um, um, they write a BPF uh, program and they send that to debus demand which will execute it to know whether to deliver it to the recipient or not. Um, another example that uh, some people have discussed on uh, Twitter is with the DNINS project. So DNINS is a framework, it's a C++ API to uh, dynamically patch uh, running um, process. So if you have a long running process and you want to update to a new version without stopping it, um, what if you edit the virtual memory of that uh, process to put the new instructions and um, hopefully it will work. <laughs> so um, what's if you will use something like that in production? <laughs> or why not? So yeah, uh, that's quite difficult to do safely. Uh, that's quite easy to make the program crash by uh, patching the memory uh, like that. So some people have discussed using uh, the BPF sandbox to add code, but which will uh, run in a safer way maybe. So um, that's it for BPF in user space. I will go back to the more uh, normal use case with the Linux kernel and talk about uh, tooling. So there is this um, IO Visor project. Um, the goal is to um, <laughs> gather um, everybody using uh, BPF or develop BPF for networking or for tracing. And they have this project uh, called uh, BCC for BPF compiler collection. And that's um, a lot of tools on example uh, with a library in C to easily use uh, BPF in your programs. And there is, um, it includes the compiler LLVM, and it has binding in Python or Lua. So this is a, not a one-liner, but a 11-liner program. Uh, but basically, that's a Python program. It uses um, eBPF, and the eBPF program is basically just uh, one string, which uh, installs a kprob on the system called clone. So every time the clone system call will be called, it will do a print K um, to, to a buffer that will be printed here in Python. So that looks uh, not too difficult, but of course there are a lot more complex uh, things you can do with the eBPF. Uh, so this is in Python and it will uh, compile the C code uh, just in time on, into the BPF bytecode and then uh, send that to the kernel. Um, so that's it. Yes. So with BCC, there are a lot of tools which has been uh, developed to inspect what's happening, uh, to, to see what's, what happened in the kernel on different subsystems, on the virtual file system, networks, etc. Um, here is one of them. 
uh, TCP tracer that Iago has developed. Do you remember that? <laughs> okay. Um, um, I can do a, a demo of a few of them. So let me take this. On, um, uh, bigger? Okay. So that's called a TCP stressor, and that's part of the BCC package. So there are packages for Fedora and other distributions. So if I run that, it will install a BPF, compile the BPF program and install it, maybe a bit smaller. And then um, if I go back there and go to some web page, uh, I see that Chrome is doing a lot of connections. So there is C for connect, X for closing the connections, etc. So if I close the tab, at some point the, it will close the connection. And I can see um, which process, which PID is doing the connection or closing the connections, IP source, IP destination, um, the ports. So I see it's HTTPS, etc. cetera. Um, another tool, BIO top. Um, supposed to show what uh, kind of process is doing I.O. on my uh, disk, on my laptop. Uh, I don't have a lot of I.O. at the moment, but I, I saw something like before. Yeah, I use an uh, encrypted disk, so de-encrypt. Um, this tool will attach to a lot of uh, X4 uh, kernel function. And when I press Control C, I will stop it, and it will show some statistics. So um, I see, for example, the function fsync. Most of the time, it takes between uh, 1,000 microseconds to 2,000 microseconds, or sometimes it's faster, or sometimes slower. And I have a histogram of uh, how much time it takes. And same thing for open, write, read. So uh, that's useful to um, debug. When something is slow on the system, there is some latency to uh, try to understand what's wrong. Maybe that's some process, maybe that's some subsystem in the kernel to be able to debug and see what's, happen what's happening. I'm not an expert in using the tool to debug things. But <laughs> Another example. It's called mount snoop, and basically it attached to the mount and unmount uh, system calls, and it will receive a notification whenever I do a mount or unmount. So I will do a new mount. Can you see? Yeah. So here it notice, oh, there is a new mount uh, with this parameter, and if I do Unmount, it will catch the event as well. Um, bash read line is interesting. Uh, this will use uh, uprob rather than uh, kprob. Basically, it will um, look at all the bash process on the system. And if they do, um, um, it will attach to the uh, f a function in the read line library, and every time I press a command here, uh, it will uh, receive the command here. And if I have several bash running, it should work as well, hopefully. Yep. And the last one, uh, function count. It can count how many uh, function, uh, any kernel function I want to count. So I can put a regular expression like a TCP star. It will uh, uh, look at all the kernel function called TCP something. Uh, there are 330 of them. And then uh, let's do some network traffic. I open some website. 
and then control C. And I see that all the functions that have been called and how many times they have been called. So yeah, TCP release callback has been called 900 times. And I can do that on any kernel function. It's not only networking, but uh, virtual file system as well. <coughs> and then I see in about one second, there was uh, 60 uh, different open calls. Um, any questions so far? Yes? So how does it communicate with user space? It brings something in the, to the start from user space. How does kernel talk to it? Uh, yes. So the question is how the uh, BPF program communicate with the user space. So the BPF program, has, um, in this case, it uses a special kind of map, uh, which is um, um, PF ring buffer. So there is a ring buffer between, uh, which is uh, the kernel can write into, and the user space can read from that. Um, so every time the BPF function, uh, the BPF program is called, it will look what are the parameters uh, and then uh, dump that into the uh, ring buffer. And then uh, user space will be notified when there is something new to read uh, in the ring buffer and read that. Yes? Uh, there are different, uh, so the question is, is the BPF uh, only for network connections or also for uh, files or other things. So there are different kind of uh, eBPF programs. There is, at the moment, maybe six or seven different kinds. And um, one kind is for network, for socket filtering, or some other kind for network, but there are also K-Prob, which are, has nothing to do with networking, but it's about um, being called every time a kernel function is called. So that's basically like putting a, tr a um, breakpoint at some instruction in a kernel. Um, so here, I think most of the demo here is about uh, using kprob or uprob. So like bash read line was about uh, uprob. Can you show some of the uh, demo code? Uh, yes. So I'm going to the uh, BCC website. That's uh, uh, github.com slash iovisor slash bcc. Can you increase the size? Is it good enough? So uh, in the readme, there are a list of examples on this and a list of tools. So in the example, the hello world one liner or 11 liner uh, code, I took it from there. Um, some are about uh, tracing, some are about networking. Most of them are tracing, I think. So let's see a random one. I don't know what it does. So that's in Python. Uh, I think all of them are in Python or Lua. But it uses um, it uses BCC uh, the BCC library, which has written in C. And then uh, some Python thing. And here, that's a big uh, string, uh, which contain C code. So this C code is actually the B, uh, BPF program. And then, uh, <coughs> so this C code, okay, it's patching the string to patch the C code. And then here, it's, um, it call a BPF on it, so you get a BPF program from that uh, C code. And it's able to do that because uh, the BCC library includes uh, LLVM on the compiler, so it can compile on the fly um, the C code and get the BPF bytecode, and then uh, attach this uh, BPF bytecode to uh, kprob. In this case, it's uh, this function, or oh, this function, sorry. So every time the kernel function uh, scaled switch is called, it will run the C code uh, that was above. Yes? Do you have any example of an eBPF program that has some basic socket filter or some other packets or some distribution procedure? Okay. Well, the question is uh, example of a BPF program that does basic uh, packet filtering. 
Uh, in BCC, I'm not sure. Uh, so if I do search for networking, ah, yes, there is. Simple HTTP filter example. So let's do that. Um, so if I want to look at the code, I guess I look at the C file. This time it's not in a big uh, Python uh, string, but it's a separate file. Um, This time it's not uh, kprob, but it's a function um, that is called to filter the socket buffer. And then it will look, uh, parse that packet and see if uh, Ethernet type is this, or if it is a TCP packet, or uh, what else does it do? Uh, it looks if there is a HTTP, so if it looks like HTTP uh, packet on uh, get or put or any HTTP command. So uh, in BPF, we don't have um, string compare or mem copy or any kind of thing which does loop. So that's uh, a bit annoying, but here they found some work on to do string comparison manually. Um, other questions? Uh, yes. Right? Well, the question is, how do we know which uh, header to put in a BPF program? So that depends on uh, which kind of BPF programs. For example, for kprops, um, kprops is not something with um, uh, stable API. Basically, it's to trace uh, kernel functions. So kernel functions can, might change from one version to another, or it might disappear or change prototype or whatever. Uh, so the header here is uh, we include the um, internal uh, kernel headers to get the internal st structure of the kernel. In this case, it's really important to um, compile with the correct header because if I compile against uh, uh, kernel 4.4 and then uh, I use kernel 4.5, it, it will not work. Um, for network, networking is more, uh, there is a stable API. And uh, in this case, here it includes the user land API, so uh, something stable, which is not supposed to change from one version to another. So for networking things, uh, I don't know exactly how to know, but uh, I guess a tech example on the existing code <laughs> is a good it's stuff. Copy -paste. <laughs> um, in this case, it's use some um, Linux public header, the one which are stable, and it has also some uh, BPF um, Headers. There is a lot of things to make things easier in uh, BCC. <laughs> yes? So how, how is that the process of compiling it and then running it? Work? Can I have this package in my workstation and then copy something on a server? Or do I need to have the header tag in the server itself? Um, if it is about, no, so the question is about um, what's the process to compile things? Do I need to compile on the same machine as uh, where the code is running? Um, so it doesn't need to be, so it depends which tool you are using. For BCC, uh, that's uh, compiled just in time. So in this case, um, you ship the source code and then it compiles just when it needs it. So you cannot uh, pre-compile really. But um, you don't have to use BCC, you can use eBPF without BCC. Uh, a lot of people do that. So in this case, you compile with uh, CLang, LLVM, or to the BPF by code, and then you can ship this BPF by code. And the way to ship it, um, if it is about networking, it's a stable API, it's like a, a system code, they don't change prototype from one version to another. So you can safely pass this by code from one machine to another. If it is about uh, kprob, that's really different. Uh, kprob are uh, not stable, that's because the purpose of that is to trace specific kernel functions which can change. Uh, if it is uh, trace points, um, there is a way to uh, introspect the um, prototype of trace point and check that uh, it's fine or it's safe to do that. So they are not supposed to break a trace point from one vers version to another. Um, 
Okay, I can continue. Uh, ah, sorry. Yes? Well, um, probably an extension <coughs> question. Is there a way, for example, that you could link the EDF program to the grid scaling or in a, in, in a, in a code base that's not really written to be compiled with the EDF compiler? For example, I have lots of C code and I have an EDF program or some EDF source code. Is there a way that you could link all that? Or is there, or should it be only shipped as a separate? Uh, so the question is, is there a way to link the BPF program with other objects, other uh, programs? So it's quite limited because in BPF, you cannot do loops, but you cannot do uh, regular function calls. Yeah. So when the function is uh, inline static, uh, that, that's fine because that's uh, not really a function, but otherwise, um, so in this context, I don't know if it really makes sense to link with other objects because uh, if you cannot do function calls to something else, then yeah. Um, so there is not much point to link with things. Um, on, on BCC or other tools that I will mention after, uh, um, usually pass the elf object to read the sections and then uh, take the relevant path and send it to the kernel. That's how they work. Okay. Um, so um, this is GoBPF. Uh, that's a library to use uh, BPF or to load and create uh, BPF code uh, in Go, in Golang. Um, it has uh, two ways of working, two ways. Uh, one way is to uh, link with a uh, BCC library, which is written in C, <coughs> and use the function from that, and uh, offer a, a Go idiomatic way of using that. And the other way is to uh, re-implement a thing itself, as, that is uh, loading uh, ELF files, object files, and uh, passing it and uh, sending that to the kernel. Um, the second one has the advantage that um, you can compile things in advance. You don't have to compile just in time. So it's on the GitHub on IOVisor. Um, so uh, we started uh, GoBPF uh, at Kinfolk uh, because there was no really uh, libraries for doing that in Go before. And we were uh, starting to work on uh, with uh, Scope, which is written in Go, and we needed to uh, add uh, BPF there. So it was not so convenient to, um, from the Go code, call an external Python code to, um, to do the eBPF part. So we started the um, uh, GoBPF library uh, based on ex existing code from uh, IO modules. And what we did at first with that was to uh, trace the TCP connections uh, whenever there is a TCP connect, accept, or close. And then, uh, this gave birth to uh, this project, which is uh, oh, uh, TCP tra Tracer BPF, which is um, similar to the TCP Tracer that I've shown before, but uh, more complex. Um, yes. And since then, uh, GoBPF is on the IOVisor um, organization and it receives uh, contrib external contributions for the new features, like for example, uprobs or uh, something to get a trace. Um, thanks, do you have any other questions? Yes? So does uh, GoBPF also go to CMAC or you compile directly? Uh, yeah, there are, um, Still, uh, so Go BPF has two ways of working. Either it's, uh, it doesn't use BCC. In this case, it doesn't compile anything. It just uh, loads an uh, ELF file, either from disk or, uh, yeah, or from a file. Um, or it uses uh, BCC. In this case, it's just uh, linking with a uh, libbcc.so. Um, uh, that's... Uh, I think in this case it can uh, use the feature from BCC that is uh, compiled just in, on, on the fly. So for ELF, uh, you basically have to have an ELF file with the code already. So you can do that however you want. If you want to write manually, that's fine. If you want to use Kilan, maybe that's better for you or for your free time. So yeah, it doesn't have to be intentional. Yeah. 
one more bit weird question really on those data structures that you showed for the app that you can share between user space and kernel space. Can you also share them with other user space? Um, yes. Like you can so. share the socket. Yes, so when you create a BPF map, that's just a file descriptor. So you can uh, inherit that or pass it to another program with an X socket or whatever. Um, and the way the eBPF program, so the BPF program is also a file descriptor. And when you call the BPF system call here to create the program, you give the instructions at that contain reference to the file descriptor of the maps. That's how he knows that this code can use um, this map. Are you going to talk about the BPF file system too? Oh, yes. <laughs> so there is a um, BPF file system. Uh, I don't know if it is mounted here. I, maybe I can check. Do you remember where it is? Sys? FSBPF. FSBPF. So it's empty, but... Uh, And it's not mounted, but do you know how to mount that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So now it's mounted, but it should be empty because I didn't use it so far. So it's not a regular file system, so I cannot do uh, this, for example. I cannot create new files. Um, but um, when you have a file descriptor for a BPF object, this is a BPF program or a BPF map, you can uh, use the BPF system calls to pin that uh, file descriptor on that file system. And then once it's there, another process can read it from the, get it back from the file system. So that's another way to share uh, BPF maps or programs between processes. Um, so I need to compile to the, um, not to the native architecture, but to uh, BPF. And I don't know if GCC supports uh, compiling to the BPF architecture. I think it doesn't. Doesn't? I think okay. it does. 